Today, the focus of our attention is on Isaiah chapter 2. Now, Isaiah chapter 2 is complex. It has multiple motifs in it. It begins with a passage that I have quoted on innumerable occasions, including here, and that is probably one of the most famous passages in the book of Isaiah. But of course, inevitably, today we discuss it both as part of the entire chapter and inevitably as connected both with what comes before it and what comes after it. So let's at least begin with these opening four verses of the chapter. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, prophesied concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And maybe already at this stage we know the centrality of Jerusalem in this prophecy, not only in the opening passage, as we shall yet see. Verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall stream to it. Of course, inevitably, one of the principal observations that I always feel compelled to highlight here is in this vision, there is a role for all the nations. They don't come at Israel. There is no agenda to convert them all to Judaism. They come as all nations. But of course, what is essential is where they come. And many peoples will go and say, Go you and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah, which as we've noted on many occasions, means not specifically law. It means instruction. It means teaching and the word of God from Jerusalem. As a technical note, I should point out that while in the translation, the closed quotation mark is placed after this clause, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths, of course, there are no quotation marks in Biblical Hebrew. And it is at least as plausible, according to many scholars, more plausible to place the closed quotation marks over here. That is, that the nations are also saying this, that out of Zion will go forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. And consequent to that, continuing with verse 4, And he will judge between the nations and reprove many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. As you know, as we all know, as I must concede, I often point out, there is an enormous wall in New York next to the building of the United Nations upon which these last words are inscribed in many languages. The Isaiah Wall. And it shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into burning hooks. Nation shall not lift a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Tragically, they failed. They didn't just fail a bit. Let's face it, they have failed spectacularly. 
the crimes against humanity that are perpetrated throughout the world. We here in Israel have nearly to glance toward our northern border, where to date over 140,000 people have been butchered, literally butchered, in the civil war that shows no signs of abatement in Syria. That's just one example among many. So it's a nice slogan. Is it more than a slogan? And as I always feel compelled to emphasize in quoting these words, the reason the United Nations failed so miserably in attaining this goal because they began their quotation too late. That is, it's very lofty to speak of being sorted into plowshares and spears into frameworks. How do you get there? So long as I'm striving to reach my goal over here, and you're striving to reach your goal over here, then inevitably, either I knock you out of my way, or you knock me out of your way, and this is impossible. The only antidote to incessant conflict is when we all realize there's one goal. There can be many missions, many ways of advancing that goal, that is one goal. It's precisely what the prophet describes. That is, again, all nations stream to it, as all nations, with unique identities and distinctive roles to play, but they're all saying, let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his path and he will go in his, in his, in his path. That is the emphasis the realization out of Zion goes forth teaching and the word of God from Jerusalem. When everyone recognizes that, then not only is conflict no longer inevitable, it is in fact absurd. Because if we all have the same goal, just different missions in advancing that goal, then naturally, I want you to advance in your mission, and you want me to advance in my mission, because we appreciate that all of those missions are subordinated to the same goal. That, only that, is the recipe for universal peace and brotherhood. Until there is that realization, tragically, conflict will remain incessant. So the prophet has shown us the way. And I certainly will concede that by the United Nations emblazoning these words of Isaiah on the Isaiah wall, the entire world concedes that the vision of universal peace and brotherhood comes from the prophets of Israel, from the Holy Bible. But again, if we're going to actually attain that goal, we need to appreciate it has to be one goal, multiple missions, one goal for all of humanity. As we've discussed on innumerable occasions, ultimately, that one goal as described, of course, geographically here, being the mountain of God's house, and spiritually, this goal is God, is the single destiny of all of humanity. But since, after all, we're coming from all different places, why would you think that everyone is going to pursue the same route in order to attain that goal? And so, indeed, there are distinctive identities, unique 
missions, specially designated roles for everyone, all nations, for all nations, coming to that one goal. Inevitably, in our considering what these immortal words are doing here at the beginning of chapter 2 of Isaiah, one of the questions we can't help but ask is, when is this supposed to be? These words of the prophet, how do they get actualized? And by whom? And at what point? It's significant to note that the motif at the beginning of the passage, that the mountain of God's house will be established at the top of mountains, is one that appears similarly in at least two other passages of the prophets. In Ezekiel chapter 40, we read, ironically, tragically, at a time of destruction. The chapter begins in the 25th year of our exile. And it was in the 14th year after the city was smitten. That we read in verse 2. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me down upon a very high mountain, whereon was, as it were, the frame of a city on the south. Now, in the previous verse, the prophet says, the hand of God was upon me, and he brought me there. The prophet, through his prophetic eye, sees the mountain of God's house. sees Jerusalem. And he sees it as a very high mountain. Set at the top of mountains, as does Isaiah. We find, indeed, the self-same expression, verbatim, practically, in the words of another prophet. The prophet Micha, the beginning of chapter 4 in the prophecy of Micha seems almost identical to the words of Isaiah. It's hard to know if one was inspired by the other or both were drawing their words from the same wellspring of inspiration. But in Micha, verse 1, and at the end of days it shall come to pass that the mountain of God's house will be established as the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And peoples will stream to it. Again, vision of all peoples. And many nations will go and say, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Go, you, and let us up the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will go in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between many peoples, and shall reprove mighty nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears and burning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In Micha, these words are followed in verse 4, by, but they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the God of hosts has spoken. So returning to our question, to whom are these prophets addressing themselves? When are these words fulfilled? And of course, the truth is, we don't know. 
on some claim, this message is a message for all generations. The end of days doesn't necessarily mean the end of this world. It can simply mean the end of the days of lawlessness, the days of corruption, the days of evil perpetrated by man against fellow man. Of course, in Ezekiel chapter 40, we appreciate that these words introduce the prophet's guided tour to the temple of the future. And as we have noted in other contexts as well, that temple of the future could have been, might have been, in some sense was designated to have been the rebuilt temple after the 70 years of Babylonian exile. It wasn't because it was an opportunity for all of Israel to return to the land of Israel that was tragically squandered. Most of the people remained in exile. They didn't return to God's land. And at some point, God didn't either. And the promises of that rebuilt temple remain the promises of the rebuilt temple for whose restoration we continue to implore God to this day. But inevitably, in considering how we relate to these words, this passage, it is, of course, important for us to consider on what background the prophet speaks of this vision of Jerusalem as a magnet to all nations, to all peoples. And again, in this vein, we see almost the same expressions in both Isaiah and Micah. Perhaps we can glean an additional crucial hint to help us understand why it is that with this passage, the second chapter of Isaiah begins. And similarly, the fourth chapter of Micha begins by considering the words that come immediately before. Well, truth is, the words that come immediately before in both Micha and Isaiah. And nothing is not terrifying. The end of Micha chapter 3. Hear this, I pray you, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all that is straight that build up Zion, we're talking about Zion here again, remember, with blood, and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for bribery, and the priests thereof teach for a price, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon God and say, Is not God in the midst of us? No evil shall come upon us. The self-righteousness of which we spoke in our discussion of chapter 1 in Isaiah, here too, Micha chapter 3. And note the focus upon Zion and Jerusalem. And the most terrifying focus of all. Chapter 3, verse 12 in Micha, the last verse of the chapter. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house 
as the high places of a forest. Utter destruction. Destruction of Jerusalem. In this light, we review the closing verses of Isaiah chapter 1. Beginning here in verse 24, Therefore says the God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. And I will turn my hand upon you and purge away your dross as with lye and will take away all your alloy, and I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. No, it's the judges. It's the judges here in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26. It was the judges, likewise, in Micha chapter 3, verse 11. Even in verse 9, speaking of they who abhor justice. In Isaiah's words, the promise, the restoration, I will restore your judges. Then you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion, again, Zion, relentlessly, the emphasis upon Zion and Jerusalem. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her penitent with righteousness. But Isaiah likewise concludes with a warning of horrific destruction. Verse 28. But the destruction of the transgressors and the sinners will be together, and they that forsake God will be consumed. And skipping to the last verse of the chapter, verse 31, And the strong will be as tow, and his work as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. Unrelenting devastation. Much as in that last verse, of Micha chapter 3, that Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become heaps, and the mountain of the house, the mountain of the house of God, the temple now, with the high places of a forest. So, it is then in the wake of such terrifying words that we consider the exalted vision of the redeemed future. When, again, the mountain of God's house is set at the top of mountains and exalted above hills and all nations, all peoples, stream to it. That is, the prophet obviously isn't sent merely to harangue, merely to threaten. This is all part of the message of mending our ways, the message of restoration, the message of doing what we need to be doing. And it is, after all, specifically in that wake that we read of the exalted vision of the Jerusalem of the future. Of course, we need to consider not only these opening four verses of chapter 2 in Isaiah, and so it is in the vein that we continue with verse 5. And part of our agenda necessarily will be to understand how the verses that follow, follow from what we saw in this exalted vision of Jerusalem. Verse 5, O house of Jacob, go you and let us walk in the light of God. And of course, inevitably, one can't help but sense that these words are kind of 
natural rejoinder to what the nations are saying in verse 3. The nations are saying, Go you and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us on his way, and we will go on his path. And in some sense, the prophet says, Okay, Jacob, what are you doing about it? This is what the nations will be doing in the future. What are you doing now? And tragically, instead of, at the very least, taking this prophecy of what the nations will be doing in the future as a challenge, as a summons to right their ways, now, instead, Jacob looks around and sees the corruptions of the other nations around them and emulates the corruption. Verse 6. The prophet turns to God and says, You have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. But you did so because they didn't give you a choice. For they are full of witchcraft from the east and with soothsayers like the Philistines, the Philistines, of course, on the west. And they please themselves in the brood of aliens. Verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land also is full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. They have all this wealth and prosperity. And where does it lead them? Verse 8. Their land is also full of idols. Everyone worships the work of his own hands that which his own fingers have made. Verse 9, And man bows down, and man lowers himself, or has become humble. Whether this, this is a description of how people bow down before their idols and lower themselves that way, or how people spiritually bankrupt themselves and lower themselves that way. The prophet says, and you shall not forgive them. You cannot bear with them because of what they're doing. And the prophet turns to the people in verse 10, tells them, enter into the rock and hide you in the dust from before the terror of God and from the glory of his majesty. Verse 11, and the lofty looks of man will be brought low, or again, humbled, and the haughtiness of men will be bowed down, and God alone will be exalted in that day. Now, the theme that we see in these verses of tremendous prosperity. Their land is full of silver and gold, no end of their treasures, full of horses, no end of their chariots, and that leads to depravity. It's something that we saw in the Torah as well, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, where Moses conveys to the people this warning, beginning in verse 11, Beware lest you forget God your Lord in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and dwell therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Sounds awfully similar to Isaiah's words as well. Then your heart is lifted up. You forget God your Lord who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who bestowed so much upon you, who led you through the great and dreadful wilderness, wherein were serpents, venomous serpents, scorpions, thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed you manna, who did everything for you to do you good at your latter end. 
What do you say? Verse 17. And you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Verse 18. That you shall remember God, your Lord, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. And of course, as we've noted in the past, it's critical for us to remember this. Number one, there is no denial that it is indeed your power that got you this wealth. Just remember who gave you the power. You have the power because he gave you the power to get the wealth. Remember what the source is. And remember that the reason you need to remember what the source is has, of course, nothing to do with God needing anything from you. That's everything to do with your needing that anchor in the spirit. That allegiance to God. God is always waiting to pour out his spirit, his goodness upon you. He wants to establish his covenant which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. But you need to make yourselves spiritually worthy of being the recipient. If all that prosperity will do to you is lead you to the conceit of arrogance, lead you to self-aggrandizement, lead you to lavish praises on yourselves, there is nothing that could possibly be worse than that prosperity for you. It will be toxic to your souls. You need to remember. You need to humble yourselves. And it's, of course, always important for us to stress. This humbling has nothing to do with belittling oneself. One should not belittle oneself any more than one should belittle anyone else. But it is critical. It has everything to do with recognizing who we are, who we are not. Recognizing what our role in the world is and what it is not. And of course, inevitably then, that returns us once again to these words of Isaiah. And I repeat again, verse 11. The lofty looks of man will be humbled, and the holiness of men will be bowed down, and God alone will be exalted in that day. And the continuation of the chapter, this theme becomes a recurrent one in verse 12. For the God of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty, and upon all that is lifted up, and he shall become humble. And the prophet continues with metaphors upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every lofty tower, upon every fortified wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the delightful imagery, or alternatively, all who dwell in homes with precious floors, all of this aggrandizement, all of this hubris, all this pride and arrogance. And again, in verse 17, the same terms that we saw earlier in the chapter, and the loftiness of man will be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man will be humbled, and God alone will be exalted in that day. And the idols will pass away because people will no longer fixate themselves on that is, which is not God, that which is not divine. And in almost the same words in both verse 19 and verse 21, 
men shall come into the caves of the rocks and into the holes of the earth from before the terror of God and from the glory of his majesty when he arrives to shake mightily the earth. And again in verse 21, to, go, to come into the clefts of the rocks and into the crevices of the crags from before the terror of God and from the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake mightily the earth. And finally, the concluding words of the chapter. Cease you from man, in whose nostrils is a breath, but for how little is he to be accounted. So when we consider these verses of the chapter, clearly the dominant message is cast away the arrogance, the arrogance, the pride, conceit. And ultimately, as expressed repeatedly, and, and God alone will be exalted in that day, which we saw in both verse 11 and in verse 17, that exalting of God, isn't it really a spiritual expression of what in verse 2 was expressed geographically or topographically that the mountain of God's house is established at the top of mountains and exalted above the hills? That is, recognize the meaning in your life, the value of your life, is not generated by self-aggrandizement. It's not protected by making yourself up to be the absolute value of existence. On the contrary, the meaning in your life you find through God to recognizing that He is the barometer of meaning in existence. We ally ourselves with God. Just as geographically the nations come to the mountain of God's house, so we all need to go through this process. Again, the lofty looks of men being humbled, the holy looks of men being bowed down. In verse 17, in almost the same words, the loftiness of men will be bowed down, the holy looks of men will be humbled, and in both instances and God alone will be exalted in that day. When we consider what the significance is of this message of being brought low, being humbled, being bowed down, it's significant to note that we have Another reference to much the same idea, a little bit later on in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5, where we read in verses 15 and 16, something very similar to what we saw in chapter 2. Verse 15, and man is bowed down and man is humbled, and the eyes of the lofty are humbled. For the God of hosts is exalted through justice, and God, the Holy One, is sanctified through righteousness. Again, this message of man being brought down, being brought low, and God being exalted. So we must note that there is an interesting and somewhat perplexing contrast. Because the truth is that in chapter 5, which obviously we'll be discussing at much greater length when we get there, the focus is not specifically on arrogance being the problem. Rather, to peruse chapter 5 oh, quickly, beginning with verse 11. Woe unto them who rise up early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink, that tarry late into the night till wine inflame them and the heart 
and the psaltery and the tablet and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. Here's where we get the problem. That they regard not the work of God. Neither have they considered the operation of his hands. They're so busy drinking, engaging in their revelries, they don't pay attention to God. And this theme of not paying attention is precisely the basis of the punishment that follows. In verse 13, therefore my people are gone into exile for want of knowledge. Then our other men will die of hunger, their multitude are parched with thirst. Such utter devastation because they didn't pay attention. They were so busy obsessing on the wine and strong drink, the festivities, the revelries, they forgot about anything spiritual altogether. They go into exile then for want of knowledge. This strikes us as a very different problem from the problem in chapter 2 of pride and arrogance. It's important for us to appreciate essentially at the root of it it's indeed the self-same problem. Because on the one hand when someone is filled with arrogance, focused on his own conceit, to whom, to what, does he pay attention? The answer, and I suspect we all can think of individuals who unfortunately personify this kind of behavior, they only think about themselves. They really just don't pay attention to anything else. They are, to use the expression in the English, so full of themselves, they can't be bothered paying attention to anyone or anything else. So pride and arrogance are indeed the basis for my people not regarding the work of God, nor considering the operation of his hands, and ultimately then going into exile for want of knowledge. But it works in the other direction as well. That is, when people don't pay attention, when they don't look around them to see what is this world in which we are living, because they don't pay attention, all they're left with is a feeling of their own greatness. We consider some other words of Isaiah that help to illustrate this very idea. In Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 21, know you not, hear you not, has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, brings princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as a thing of naught. Scarce are they planted. Scarce are they sown. Scarce had their stock taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them, they wither, and the whirlwind takes them away as stubble. To whom, then, will you liken me, that I should be equal, says the Holy One. You're not paying attention. You're not paying attention, and that's why you're not noticing. And the solution, expressed in verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see 
who has created these? He that brings out their host by number, he calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and for that he is strong in power, not one is missing. And in verse 28, in responding to the additional complaint of Jacob, that my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? His discernment is past searching out. Just pay attention. This arrogance, this pretentiousness, is because you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world. You have eyes that you're not seeing. And indeed, in much the same vein, in Psalm 8, verse 4, and it's also casting my glance heavenward. When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you think of him? Yet you made him but a little lower than the divine, and have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, everything. And while that could lead us once again to the pridefulness, the arrogance, I'm the boss. I control everything. What it needs to engender in us is precisely the opposite. The realization as expressed in verse 10. Oh God, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. To appreciate God's greatness by paying attention that is the antidote to the arrogance. In a similar vein, in Psalm 89, beginning in verse 6, so shall the heavens praise your wonders, O God, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the Holy Ones. For who in the skies can be compared unto God? Who among the sons of might can be likened unto God? A God revered in the great council of the Holy Ones and feared of all them that are about him. O God, God of hosts, who is a mighty one like unto you, O God, and your faithfulness is round about you. Again, the sense of grandeur, of wonderment. It's not for God's sake. He doesn't need it. It's for our sake. We do. The sense of where we fit into a much, much bigger picture than we could even imagine. And again, it is perhaps ironically, perhaps counterintuitively, specifically by our considering the vastness, the greatness of that big picture. A vastness so great that we seem to be reduced to insignificance within it. It's by considering that, that we appreciate our importance in something that is incomparably greater than we are. If instead we try to harp arrogantly on our own pretensions of importance, we don't find the real importance. On the contrary. We delude ourselves or lose ourselves. And so, again, returning to Isaiah chapter 2, that message of being humble, that message of being brought low, 
is really a message of being with ease, of finding ourselves. Now, of course, inevitably, we can't help but ask, so why is this all put together? The beginning of chapter 2 with these words of an extraordinarily exalted vision of all the nations coming here to Jerusalem with the words of rebuke, dire warning. We have one final passage that I'd like to consider that I think provides us with a couple of important keys to unlocking this mystery. And this is yet another prophet and another prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 3. We begin in verse 12, and as becomes almost immediately obvious, the significance here of Zion and Jerusalem is likewise inescapable. But we begin again with verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, you backsliding Israel, says God. I will not frown upon you, for I am merciful or pious, says God. I will not bear grudge forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against God your Lord and have scattered your ways to the strangers under every leafy tree, and you have not hearkened to my voice, says God. Return, O backsliding children, says God, for I am the Lord unto you, and I will take you one of a city, or two of a family, and I will bring you a sign. And this is, of course, manifestly reminiscent of what we saw in Isaiah chapter 1. I will give you shepherds according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Remember, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26, I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Same idea. And in verse 16, it will come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says God, they will say no more. The translation I think is most cogent here is the Ark of the Covenant of God without it coming to mind. No more lip service. Neither will they mention it without their recalling it and without its words being done. It won't really be an external expression anymore. Now, of course, inevitably, this is the Ark the focal point of the Holy Temple. It will not merely be an object of lip service. In the pretentious arrogance, remember, of those who say, as expressed in the words of Micha, right before his exalted vision, is not God in the midst of us? No evil shall come upon us. We're just fine. to really, truly appreciate what our task is, is God. And what that leads to, verse 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of God. That means all the nations will be gathered unto it, to the name of God, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after this governess of their evil heart. That is, these words of rebuke, for they surely are words of rebuke, are inextricably linked with 
the promise of a restored Jerusalem to which the whole world streets. Everyone's coming. And it's clearly the case after all. Isaiah sees the entire world coming there in chapter 2. Jeremiah sees the whole world coming there in chapter 3. Micah sees the whole world coming there in chapter 4. Each prophet, in his own words, from his own perspective. Why are these words so critically interleaved with the words of warning and review? Well, first answer, and of course, inevitably, this is a critical theme in Jeremiah chapter 3. I will not frown upon you, for I am merciful, I am pious, says God. I will not bear grudge forever. God doesn't warn us to threaten. He doesn't punish us to hurt. He teaches us to heal us spiritually, to restore us, to right our ways. So, of course, inevitably, only telling us everything that we're doing wrong is inadequate. There also has to be that vision of what are you striving to reach? Where do you need to get? What is the ultimate goal? And the ultimate goal, again, is not only that God is exalted alone on that day, but the mountain of the house of God is set at the top of mountains and exalted above the hills so that all the nations stream to it. That's a critical component of the rebuke consolation because they are necessarily linked to one another. Rebuke without consolation is just depressing. Consolation without rebuke is empty words. God, in his boundless love of us, in bidding all his children to return to him by their unique missions, gives us both the words of rebuke and the words of consolation, both telling us what we're doing wrong and what we need to do right in order to attain this exalted goal. There is one final element that I also feel compelled to share with you. And I express this in the title of today's session, The Great Homecoming of Putting Man in His Place. I don't know if you all get the connotation of the English idiom, but when in English we speak of putting someone in his place, basically it means He's too arrogant and conceited, and you're putting him down to put him in his place. So putting a person in his place obviously means to not be arrogant, to not be prideful. But in Isaiah chapter 2, putting us in our places, putting us all in our places, of course, means putting us here in Jerusalem. Because all the nations ultimately will realize this is the place they need to get. This is the place toward which all nations stream. Putting them in their place isn't merely putting them down, depressing them. On the contrary, by enabling us to glimpse that exalted world of God's kingdom where the mountain of God's house is set at the top of mountains, exalted above the hills, where indeed God alone is exalted on that day. It's what inspires us most of all to relinquish the pride, the arrogance, the external trappings that are of us what we really are. Hungry, thirsty, as the prophet almost expresses it, to the words of God, for returning home. 
to him. The great homecoming of indeed being put in what is truly our place. That is the greatest blessing. God bless you.